شكرا 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 Thank you, Professor Tarek, for this introduction. Uh, this is the last uh, lecture in the session, and we are trying to answer the difficult question. After the SGLT2 trial, how could we put all these together to treat a patient with heart failure and preserve the ejection fraction? But at first, I like to illuminate the magnitude of the problem. If you think that the quality of life in patients with heart failure would be better compared to patients with heart failure and those patients with heart failure and improved ejection fraction, you are totally mistaken. And also, when it comes to the rates of rehospitalization after the time of the first event, no difference between those patients who had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the fifth patients. And even the blood faster, the all cause mortality, the long term survival in patients with heart failure and heart breath are quite similar. So, when you are going to speak about the quality of life, when you are going to speak about rehospitalization rates, and even all cause mortality, both are doing the same. And the bad news is that despite the fact that survival rates where health threat has improved dramatically over years, we are not doing well in health threat patients. Survival rates in health threat patients have not improved across years. So we have a problem until 2021 and 2022 with the introduction of SGLT2 inhibitors and safety by beta tartan for those patients together with MRK. But at first, I'd like to tell you some information. First, those patients until recently are not treated even in Egypt. I'd like to allude to Professor Mahmoud Hassanin when he told that we are not using our Egyptian data. We have already published in the Egyptian Heart Journal, part of the European Society of Cardiology, long-term registry about two years ago, 1,600 patients hospitalized recently for heart failure, and boom, half of them are treated with beta blockers, ACE, ARTS, and MRA. Right or wrong, but this is the fact. We need more therapists to solve the problems. And here is the story. When Stephen Anton stated on the podium in 2021, giving the audience a nonsense about the heart failure guidelines in 2021, he told us that you should screen for comorbidities in patients with health care, and you should treat them with diuretics, and then the remainder of this slide has been left a blank. And I do think that he intentionally left a left blank to give up uh, some information about what's the gap in evidence. Because all trials, all completed trials in health patients were negative. And even if you look into the major outcome trials, the chart reserved for candy sarcoid. The PEP for the endocrine, I present for LB Sartan, and even the main analysis of the TOPCAT trial, all these trials were done against the placebo term negative. And recently, we have data. Look with me to this important secondary analysis from the TOPCAT trial, evaluating the influence of ejection fraction on the outcomes and the efficacy of spironolactone in patients with PEP. And at the end of the day, it turned out that the potential efficacy of spironolactone in those patients was greatest at the lower end of the ejection fraction spectrum. And despite the fact that the main analysis of the Baragon Heart Failure Trial, the basal cardiovascular outcome trial of safety vitamin Balzartan in heart failure patients did not meet its primary endpoint, it barely missed the statistical significance on the verge of seven events, but there were direction in the right direction Good analysis, please specify good analysis from the Baradine Heart Failure Trial and the Baradine Heart Failure Trial, comprising more than 13,000 patients, showing that there was a significant linear graded response between the ejection fraction and the outcomes, starting down from ejection fraction of around 25 and going up to an ejection fraction of 57 and 60. Those patients benefited significantly of 
take your vitamin by doctor. And the female patients benefit significantly compared to men's, and this is biologically plausible because female patients comprise the vast majority of med patients, especially in the Egyptian population. That's why the FDA in February 2021 gave notch approval to certify pentobarbital in some patients with heart failure and locked out the wording to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization of heart failure. And benefits locked out the wording are most clearly evident in patients with ejection fraction below the normal. The question is, what's the normal ejection fraction? I can swear that no one knows. Please note that the ejection fraction is a highly variable measure. So always use clinical judgment in your prescription. And then now let's tell you the story, the serendipity, the lucky story of SGLT2 inhibitors. After the cardiovascular safety outcome data provided us astonishingly consistent signal towards reduction of the future hospitalization due to heart okay. failure, those drugs were treated or tried in patients with heart failure with or without diabetes across the spectrum, heparin and heparin. And we had recently two major randomized cohort trials testing the two major SGLT2 inhibitors in heparin patients. The emperor presented trial evaluating the empathy protein in heparin patients. And recently, this was published about two or three months yeah. ago, the deliver trial evaluating labagliflozin in heart failure patients with preserved yeah. and some patients yeah. with improved yeah. ejection fraction and mild improved ejection fraction. And this is the best slide I'd like to project today. This slide puts the main results of all the trials in comparison in the context. If you look to the primary outcome, there was nearly identical, consistent movement around 20% significant relative risk reduction of the primary outcome, which was composite of cardiovascular death and total worsening of heart failure. And if you look specifically to worsening of heart failure, which is defined as urgent heart failure visits and the total burden of hospitalization, again, there was significant reduction, which was consistently equal between both trials. However, if you look into cardiovascular death specifically, you will find that it barely misses the statistical significance. And I think this is peculiar because patients with heart failure and result ejection fraction are already, are already with good ejection fraction. And all of us know that ejection fraction in and of itself is an independent predictor for cardiovascular death in the future. However, finally, if you look into the total, total primary outcome, again, there was consistent equal reduction in the total primary outcome events. These are solid data. But the question remains, how do we compare diabetic patients with heart failure to non-diabetics? Those drugs, more or less, were initially invented to be an anti-diabetic drug. But do we have evidence comparing diabetic patients versus non-diabetics? Actually, this is hope of the press. About one month ago, our group, and those are all Egyptian authors, have published the most comprehensive, and this is the first announcement, and updated data analysis on heart failure outcomes for SGLT2, comparing patients with diabetes versus non diabetes. This is the abstract, and the paper has been accepted in the American Journal of Cardiology, and it will appear a few days later. This meta-analysis included 13 randomized controlled trials, comprising data from more than 75,000 patients, including even the recent data from the delivered trial. What we showed is that SGLT2 inhibitors significantly reduced heart failure hospitalization, equally in both patients with diabetes and without diabetes. But when it comes to cardiovascular death, the signal for reduction of cardiovascular death in diabetic patients were significant. However, when it comes to non-diabetics, the signal for reduction of cardiovascular death may invest in the statistical significance. So the question is, do we need more data in patients who are not diabetic to corroborate the evidence behind SGLT2 inhibitors? Who knows? But the guidelines for the first time in 2022, 
with SGLT2 inhabitants in class 2A education for health and patients, Army, MRA, and ARP class 2B. And I feel this is good. I'm happy for this. This is the first time we see color coding for some drugs in patients with health care. But we want to put all these together. What should I do beside? First, and I do think that this is the most important step in patients with heart failure and result ejection fraction, please treat comorbidities. You can give the patient the best drugs in the market and you are not giving him few additional minutes to discuss the importance of weight reduction, to discuss the importance of how she could cut my steroids, eat well, sleep well. I do think this is the core value of good doctoring. Before you give the patient the blockbuster drugs, sit with the patient, give him some time. Also, please don't forget to give those patients diuretics. Actually, actually, ironically, diuretics up to this moment so far, these are the drugs that are giving us one recommendation in health care patients. Those patients usually need decongestion. Some of us forget about them. And then the third step is that you should use, we just mentioned the drugs. But how could we employ these drugs? What's the order? In which order I could prescribe MRA, SGLT2, RME, diuretics, and so on? I'd like to give you some tips and tricks, and these are the American expert algorithm as mentioned in the upper day. This is not my algorithm. This is how the American experts are treating those patients. They usually start SGLT2 and MRA. Both. And by both, I mean not one of them. Usually, they start as GLP2 inhabitant first, and after just one or two weeks, they give the patient MRA. But please note that we have no trials up till now that examine whether combination therapy has an additive benefit compared to either agent alone. And if the patient is having diabetes and safety at this line, Rest blockers may, may be used as first line therapy together with SGLT2 inhibitors. And for those patients with herpes who are still having persistent symptoms and adequate blood pressure, despite the use of optimal SGLT2 inhibitors and MRA, they usually add sacubacterin valdartan, and they do not recommend usage of device with therapy. Forget about it because we have trials proving that this doesn't work. Just one minute. This is the algorithm for initiating spironolactone in those patients after you ensure that the patient on SGLT2 inhibitor, ensuring that he or she is not hyperkalemic and the GFR is more than 30, you can introduce it, uh, spironolactone in a dose of 12.5 and you can increase the slide of second. And you can and you can increase the dose to 15 milligrams, which is the target dose if the patient is maintained the normal pandemic and the GFR is more than 30. And finally, about initiating safety vitamin panzartan, they do recommend that you should initiate safety vitamin panzartan after you ensure that the patient on SGLT2 inhibitor and MRA with persistent heart failure symptoms, adequate blood pressure, serum potassium below five, GFR. Above 30, you can give sacrifice to Transartan, and we do think that this drug has a very good quality of life, improving capability in those patients. I'm grateful that you listen, and thank you.